Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. In the days of old maybe, there was no background training in fire investigation as part of that role. You were literally just working from your limited experience in that time. If you ask a member of the public or even members of the fire service about um, fire investigation, their expectation is the fire service would yeah, clearly do fire investigation. <laughs> there is no actual statutory duty for a fire and rescue service to conduct fire investigation. And I train across uh, you know, the UK and Europe and internationally and in some countries still. So in Ireland, it's the Garda, the police that investigate um, fires. The fire service don't get involved. However, fire and rescue services in the UK have powers, so they can use those powers to investigate Bias is a massive thing with in- investigation. We've got to avoid all bias and, and we've got to, you know, factually based and evidence based um, hypothesis. So you will see investigators standing back, just trying to absorb the scene and thinking about what was original um, fire damage. Yeah, interviewing techniques is about measurements, sketch drawings, photographing, and that's really been the sort of way of documenting scenes um, up until modern times. But we're definitely seeing introduction of 360 imaging, 3D scanning, photogrammetry, and these are all methods where we can rapidly capture a scene. And rather than sitting looking at stills photographs, trying to interpret them, we can later on during our, our report writing, etc., we can re-immerse ourselves in that, that scene. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex going further together. Martin, welcome to the podcast, my friend. How are you? Good morning, Pete. Thanks for having me on. I am really, really excited about this conversation, which is uh, by no means meaning to set you up to fail and no pressure, but um, your role or your profession as it's taken you to as a fire scene investigator is something that I'm really passionate in going into more depth about. I did around two years of it as part of my role in operational assurance and also I've just shared with you one of my recent favorite books by one of the UK's leading pathologists and it's really like the the thought process around it but I'm going to start by just giving a little overarching so you are Martin Lown, BEM, fire uh, fire scene investigator, fire investigation trainer, you've served over 30 years in the UK Fire and Rescue Service at various levels, uh, senior officer level, Uh, You're now Managing Director of Phoenix Forensic Service Provider and Firewise UK Learning Academy, providing fire investigation services, training, CPD, and all that special stuff. And you also do a lot of work with our friends over at IRRTC, um, who are a whole host of lovely folks, um, breaking out from the traditional and delivering some really good value on stuff. But I wanted to kind of cycle back and start way back before any of this uh, you know, before you compiled all of this CPD for want of a better description, what kind of brought you into the emergency services and I suppose your life prior to that? Yeah, well, Pete, um, yeah, going back to my youth, um, grew up in the southeast of England, um, was fortunate, went to a boys grammar school. So I think that's where sort of the, the formal and strict uh, discipline came in right from an early age. Mm. Um, it was very much a rugby school, army cadets, etc. Um, I was destined for university. I had a place at Loughborough reading geography. Um, and uh, again, followed through with the sort of discipline side of things, University Officer Training Corps, and secured a commission with um, Royal Engineers at Sandhurst. So that was my destiny, really. Um, unfortunately, I lost my mum to cancer around that time, about age 17, uh, middle of the exams, etc. Um, so, yeah, in, in layman's terms, dropped out, if you like, first year of university, um, just decided to change to University of Life or the University of the Outdoors. Um, was, and was I went off traveling. around then, sorry. Sorry? Was your dad still around then? Sorry. Yeah, dad was still around, although the family sort of bombed us then. Um, dad ended up getting remarried and moving up to the Highlands of Scotland. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, very happy for that. Uh, and we you know, still visit the Highlands um, regularly. 
Mm. But um, yeah, so um, that led me to, I traveled and worked abroad, um, predominantly New Zealand and then France and lived there uh, delivering outdoor pursuits, instructing, river guiding, that sort of type of thing. And came back to the UK around age 21 um, with a sort of uh, thought that I better get a, a career. <laughs> um and because <laughs> i'm of the still thinking think, the same thing now i need a proper job <laughs> at some point <laughs> absolutely um but uh yeah so due to my background discipline side of things i was thinking yeah uniform service still probably regretted that i didn't go into the army um regular yeah. but I, I started off back in the territorial reservists with the army um and was considering strongly a sort of police career um principally uniform service the variety of of roles etc um, but it purely opened the paper one day and Surrey Fire Brigade advertised um, and I'd never even considered the fire service, to be honest, in those days. Um, and uh, yeah, within 12 months, I'd gone through the process, quite a lengthy process in those days. And um, yeah, found myself um, starting at Ray Park Training Centre in 1993 in the January course. Um, usual 50, well, 15 week course then in those days. So residential course in old army billets, um, Nissan huts. Uh, very much, you know, room inspections, bed blocks, yeah, you know, everything those times of days that probably been uh, passed by now. But um, yeah, uh, went through the training centre, ended up um, at base at Chertsey on the west of Surrey, South London, um, but predominantly M25. So very much early career was based around road traffic collisions on the major motorway. Um, but also rope rescue, BA instructor, RTC instructor, all the usual um, instructor qualifications you pick up. And um, moved up to lean firefighter within three years and um, started doing various roles. And I actually met my wife at the fire service. Um, she worked in the IT department and uh, becoming an LF and moving into a desk job. Never used a computer before. So I used the help desk quite a bit. And uh, and Lisa was uh, on the other end of the help desk. So that's how we met and ended up um, getting together and getting married. I want to circle back on a few things. That I've made a few notes as you're speaking in my mind. This is a real discipline for me. I'm really getting, trying to get better at it is not interrupting whilst no people problem. are talking about things because I get so excited like a child about a few things. <laughs> circle me back and I would love to double click on grammar school and officer training corps because we've, we've interwoven different aspects of discipline there. And I know before we came on, we spoke about the fact that you're still engaged in, in scouting. And I remember reading about, <clears throat> you know, if you look across uh, global leaders there is a very uh, common trend around around scouting around uh, ranger school around different elements and i want to overlay that with the principle of discipline and how it gets a lot of negative connotations but i know a number of people that went to grammar schools and actually speak very highly of it yeah most definitely um yeah i think we were fortunate much at the time my parents were um yeah busy, well my dad was a painter and decorator by trade so you know we'll work in uh mum was a teacher but they put all three of uh the sons um i'm the youngest of three put us through jam grammar school in those early days um yeah probably to give us the best start but yeah very much um uh a traditional so was this a grammar residential school. grammar school sorry did you you, you say no from... this is it was a day day school so yeah just a day school at grammar school in surrey um rygate grammar school um, very much that formal discipline in those days. So I went in at lower, lower first, wearing shorts and blazer and cap. Um, the masters all wore capes and uh, carried canes around. Um, and it was very much that uh, it was all boys at that time. It's now co-ed, but uh, all boys at that time. Um, and very much a uh, rugby focus school, um, very much, um, uh, yeah, cadets. Uh, well, they tend cadet to be form. generally very heavily sport focused anyway. I mean, friends that I visited back when I was uh, visiting grammar schools and stuff like that, they would do sport and tell me, I know it's different everywhere, but they did sport pretty much every morning or afternoon. And then on the Saturdays would almost be like a school sports day every Saturday. Was it similar for yourself or... Yeah, absolutely, Pete. Um, early morning basketball, um, literally seven o'clock every morning. Um, lunchtime, swimming, canoeing, uh, all sorts of activities. And then within the school academic program, obviously sport and PE. Wednesday afternoons, very much rugby orientated down at the um, sports field. Uh, and as you say, Saturday was you know, matches, um, traveling uh, home or away, um, lots of tours. So I toured uh, Holland and Canada with the rugby team. So, yeah, very much that um, team focus uh, throughout the whole school room. I don't want to drag you too far down this rabbit hole. I promise I will come back out of it at some point. But I don't want to leave um, useful gems un, un sort of 
and over and overturned if we can. Um, I think there's so many useful aspects. And my sister's a, a primary school teacher; she's a deputy head. And I know there's a lot of stuff about taking edu- um, taking some physical education stuff out of the curriculum, not out of malice or anything like that. And we won't go into that rabbit hole. But I just wanted to ask your personal thoughts on the development for yourself and your brothers around maybe that competitive aspect, the teamwork aspect, because people just think, oh, well, or some people think it, you just want everybody to be fit, Pete. It's just about physical. And I said, no, no, it's, it's honestly, that's a very small amount of it with personal, you know, for me, it's aspects of leadership, aspects of personal um, interactions and calibration, how to give feedback, how to work as part of a team. What were your takeaways? And if you, if I were to ask you to champion the values that you took away from a focus on, uh, not just physical activity, but that sort of lifestyle. What do you think it took away? What do you think you took away from it? Oh, definitely that it wasn't really the focus on winning, although it was always nice to win. But plenty of occasions when we uh, we didn't win. But uh, no, very much it's being yeah part of that team. Uh, and you say within the team, uh, certainly with rugby, uh, you got subgroups, you know, forwards, backs, um, yeah, captaincy, etc. So yeah, very much um, that sense of representing um, the school. Mm. um and very much you know sort of uh, yeah, that expectation that accountability but like you also said that learning how to lose as well that's if you're not engaged in sport you don't really get as many opportunities to learn how to lose as your child and then people end up learning how to lose in their 20s and their 30s and they don't take it very well absolutely yeah if uh you know following a loss it was straight back in the into the changing rooms sit down <clears throat> coach debriefing learning points and it was all about yeah like say continuous improvement um, and that's something that's gone through my life, really. Um, yeah, me as an individual, I'm a very detailed person, structured process procedure, but always about um, change for the better and continuous improvement. So I think that stuck with me right from the uh, early days, really. I was a um, continuous improvement engineer in my old company, and we did okay, all so the Kaizen, Six Change Sigma, for Kaizen, oh, yeah. Marginal Gains, you know, David Brailsford. We would go around and deliver all that training at various sites across the UK, and that's really what birthed that aspect um for me and then also the the conversational aspect of like say giving feedback you know situation behavior impact and all of these little great models and carrying out five whys and feedback processes of people and just learning those subtle arts of communication which i think in the age of electronics now i have grave concern that we're hemorrhaging it and i also think that's one of the reasons for the tremendous growth in podcasts because people are wandering the desert starved for an engaging conversation where both parties are hopefully um, listening actively, you know, paraphrasing, asking insightful, open questions. And I think it's something that we're really losing. And again, I think it's a great quality at grammar schools because they often, when I've been there, they do encourage people to stand up and talk and take ownership and do little team teachers in, in sport and in sessions. And like you said, the 7am stuff, there's a greater aspect of self-accountability as well with it. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I say, it's that um, yeah, self admin, if you like, sorting yourself mm. out, timekeeping, um, yeah, performing, but uh, and and just that, as you said, in the professional world, that professional curiosity, um, wanting to ask questions, wanting to learn, um, and not only learn yourself but develop others. Um, yeah, big big fan of coaching and mentoring throughout my my career, and also within my youth work as well. So how much of those initial seeds got accelerated or further watered in your officer training aspect? Because people speak, people speak very highly of places like Sandhurst, but uh, I've certainly never visited yes. the site. I've spoken to many people that have been there, but could you give people the elevator pitch of what your time there gave you? Yeah, so um, I served through, through the Territorial Army and later Reservists, uh, and it was actually on exercise um, one 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 time with sort of two weeks into exercise. Um, everybody's, you know, the whole whole unit was, uh, yeah, tired and weary and cold and wet. And actually one of the DS directing staff um, pulled me to one side and he just noted that I was still trying to, yeah, keep the team going, if you like, um, motivating, et cetera. Um, and he's, he's one of the people that uh, sort of, you know, prompted me to, to think about um yeah looking at that leadership aspect further within the within the military um so i went and did my sort of uh, initial four day sort of intake at sandhurst sort of a uh, uh try and test sort of day uh, what do you and, have to uh, what do you have to have to get into sandhurst sorry well it, it's just you have to go through um interview panels with the military um but it's that what they're looking for is those you know um seed seeds if you like and like say probably mm. picking up on the background your your personal character, your resilience, your leadership. Um, but obviously the the military are very good at um, 
breaking you down and then remodeling you into uh, the standard issue, if you like. So, um, no, so, uh, yeah, I think um, anything in that leadership world um, in the military, uh, yeah, translated into the public services. But obviously these days, probably over my career, I saw that diluted a lot in, in the um, public services, certainly. Yeah, you know, that's where we there. can get a little bit lost sometimes. Because you're, are you familiar with the book Grit by Angela Duckworth? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's some some great studies within that around uh, Sanders, doesn't it? I think they use it as a case study uh, for some of it. But people do. If we take ourselves now to your time joining the Fire and Rescue Service, people do sometimes poke fun at the fact that we are most certainly not the military, and I don't think we pretend to be. But again, there's nothing wrong. For me personally, in recognizing the value of certain principles, values, behaviors, um, structures, and that's very much a spectrum. And you see it in different services, police, fire, you know, ambulance and all that sort of stuff. But certainly you see it in different spectrum across different fire rescue services, training departments across the world. So in your 15 week course, you said that it was very much the um, at the end of your beds, you know, kit inspections and stuff like that. I have concerns that sometimes we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater under the cloud of not wanting to, you know, people to get bullied and things like that. And absolutely, there was certainly aspects of that back then. But I do think there was also tremendous value, and I don't want us to lose too much of that. Hundred percent. I think, uh, and these days, you know, I was at training center. I was training center manager for five years during my career, and um, new intakes of recruits. When sort of, I gave them a little uh, presentation about the the sort of heritage of the fire service, and you know, the the fact that the the eight tenants of the cat badge all meaning something. Uh, and it's amazing we've lost that knowledge and awareness of where the fire service came from, the sort of marine nautical background terminology, even that people use, you know, this day, but still, you know, have got no clue about the heritage. But yeah. yeah, as you said, yeah, very much in those days, you know, training center was, you know, full, uh, you know, smart turnout, um, marching around, saluting officers, etc. And I'm not saying that's uh, what we should still be doing, but it certainly set that self-discipline, self-respect. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I say the as what, well. as in the what, what you do can change, but the why you're doing it should remain. And the Absolutely. what back then was marching and the why was showing respect, you know, learning how to work as a team, learning how to lead. Um, all that sort of stuff. So there's lots of ways to do that. But like I've just said, you know, some people throw the entire thing out and forget that was actually some really, there was some logic in that. It wasn't just Neanderthals wanting to massage their ego whilst people marched around them. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And yeah, if you look at the end result is getting um, individuals that are working on the incident ground to both work individually, but also work as a team, yeah, to respond to, you know, safety commands immediately without question. So Mm. like I say, it's all those fundamental underlying skills that maybe at the time, you don't understand why you're doing those um, uh, skills and activities, but uh, it's all, you know, part of forging the the emergency responder of the the team, basically. Mm. Thank you for, for humoring that. I just think there's so much valuable gold within those first few aspects of your life. I didn't want to jump past them. But um, take us now to, you said you, you moved into that sort of LF role. Tell, talk to me about the decision to move from firefighter to LF, because some people say that is the most challenging role. It's the first time you um, start to separate from the team, perhaps. And, and we can talk about that, if that is the case or not. And also kind of hold yourself to a different standard, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think it was my station officer at the time. We In those days, we had rider station officers, so station officer on the pump, um, multi-pump station at Rygate, a um, couple of appliances, rope rescue, specialisms, etc. Uh, and I, he came to me and sort of suggested that there was vacancies uh, coming up and that, um, yeah, although I was three years in, I'd had very busy stations, very um, busy probationary period for two years and uh, really embedded all my skills. And I'm, I'm guessing, you know, in hindsight, it, he saw my my background and my my personal skills um so yeah but like I say probably the biggest step in terms of role within the, the fire service um mm-hmm. suddenly you're gone from yeah being one of the team to sat in the front seat um yeah having to make uh, those key decisions etc um but always with the team's backing i think um yeah you, you're given rank but you earn that respect um and yeah and i actually then moved off station and went up to headquarters for a period of time which i was very much operationally focused and that stayed with me throughout my career um so actually to think about leaving the fire station and, and going up to headquarters was a challenge at that time was that the best route within <laughs> very early much on the in same my career myself mate yeah 
Right, yeah. Um, so I ended up in uh, what was called staff office at the time, um, just sort of you know, supporting the principal officer team and uh, doing the home office returns and all that sort of type of things. And I did find that challenge. Yeah, I was very you know, hands-on operational background. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, use that opportunity to learn more about the the wider organization. Um, start getting involved. Yeah, obviously. It, it's like seen... you look behind the curtain and see what all the cogs are doing, don't you? And it gives you a greater appreciation and more holistic view of how important all these aspects are. We can unconsciously just see ourselves as the tip of the sword, can't we? And uh, forget that there's such an enormous machine behind us. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's, yeah, right through to current day, you know, all the teams out there, their individual locations, especially in sort of more rural brigades where the on-call station is the fire and rescue service in the, in the, their community. You yeah. know, even their community don't see the, the bigger organisation. But for those individuals, yeah, their focus, rightly so, is, is their station, their community. Um, but sometimes, yeah, they go through their careers, not, uh, like you say, again, that holistic approach uh, mm. or a holistic view of the organisation. Um and I say sometimes that can, um, yeah, they can miss out on the key aspects of, you know, the changing the service. And also, and you understand the why, don't you? You understand the why a lot more because otherwise you can attribute certain decisions to someone's poor judgment, to someone's own, you know, personal politics. You go, oh, they've just made that decision because of X, Y, Z or ABC. But you've not had the insights and you don't fully understand all of the parties and motivations and legal requirements of the structure that sits behind them. Um, like I often say, because there's people moaning all over the UK Fire and Rescue Service at the minute about the hemorrhaging of skill set and why don't we just employ loads more people so that we can do that you know, proper handover and everybody can benefit from it. They forget that we're not like a business where we can over-invest in something for the future benefit of the organizer. I mean, we can to an extent, but what I mean is we legally cannot go over our budgets. So a lot of places, you've got certain people that might have three months until they can retire but they don't have to retire then and whilst we know it takes us three to six months to train a firefighter if not longer then there is always going to be that void to an extent unfortunately and people think it's worse than it's ever been but it's not they had the same problem probably 30 years ago and perhaps you saw this same challenge then because these things are cyclic you know we have that large intake and then things go quiet for a decade in in terms of recruitment perhaps yeah, absolutely. And, and like I say, is, um, those external pressures, whether it's regulations, legislation or budgets or political, um, like I say, it's constraints that some some in the service you know, will never see or understand. Um, and certainly in my my sphere of fire investigation, it's you know the host of governance behind it, um, oh, yeah. the NFCC, National Competency Framework, the Forensic Capability Network, Forensic Service Regulators, Science Regulators, um, you know, uh, approved code of practice. We we have to work under the banner of all this um, sort of regulations, legislation, and good mm-hmm. practice. Um, but people don't realise that they they yeah you know, they see fire investigators turning up at the scene and almost yeah you know, is it a witchcraft um, <laughs> to walk in, <laughs> uh, determine the cause and origin, and and disappear off again. But uh, they don't necessarily see the the forensic service. Take me to your your first interaction with that. Perhaps maybe this is, is is a nice segue. How early on in your career did you first learn about the aspects of fire investigation, or even police investigation, or scenes of crimes officers? What was your first maybe interaction with observing that? Because for members of the general public, they will see CSI and things like that, which doesn't inherently have a lot to do with fire investigation, but that will be their closest interpretation to scenes of crime incidents and stuff like that but people forget i think with fire investigation there is an enormous economical cost and the ripples of incidents across societies so people do want to see the cause and accountability but what was your first maybe introduction to this side of the work i think that's a really interesting point actually because um i'd say uh just twist some words there my first introduction to fire investigation was as soon as you took that leading firefighter crew commander rank okay. you you conduct tier one routine investigations because every job you go to uh you're determining cause and origin and then recording that on the national irs the information yeah, the irs and it goes what was the cause where did yeah, it start so, and you're like, um, um I think... electrical um so yeah i think so i think there's two two parts of the question there is when did i start doing fire investigation and that for everybody is as soon as you take that um that command role but actually, when we so with respect to your that, service, sorry, had you had no because this is a real bugbear of mine. People step in into their first LF roles, or they don't a lot. That a lot of the time, they don't receive any administrative training. They just go right now. You're in charge of crewing, fire investigation, discipline procedures, welfare, blah 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 blah, and they go okay, and then fumble for the next three years and make so many 
uh, absolutely unconscious yeah age. and, and I, th- I think that's the thing is um so, you know in the in the days of old maybe there was no um background training in fire investigation as part of that role um you were literally just working from your limited experience in that time uh, maybe consulting with the team etc but uh, these days i think um the the development uh, programs for supervisory commanders is better mm. Um, definitely could be better um, but um, certainly within my own service um, we had um, but we were given a one hour slot to you know introduce fire investigation to those new commanders um, uh-huh. yeah and I think there's still a massive gap um, the NFCC national competency framework and the new fire standard for fire investigation says that all uh, fire investigators which includes those crew commanders at tier one routine fires um, should be trained to the equivalent level two um, but there's a yeah, massive gap in that training. Um, some services have um, you know, uh, provided that training on, online, mm-hmm. uh, but there's a, a huge demand out there. And that was part of the reason for me, uh, one, of my, one of my areas of business is Firewise UK Learning Academy. Uh, and we are delivering that tier one online program to try and reach out to those commanders to give them the, the required basic understanding of fire investigation, the mm-hmm. roles and responsibles responsibilities at that commensurate with that their level uh but more importantly to recognize when fire investigation is required and to escalate to the tier two um re- based on you know either uh, injury or, or loss of life or uh, so could i ask us to go into uh, could we delve into that rabbit hole a little bit both to connect the dots for brand new firefighters coming into services people that are perhaps thinking of stepping into those leadership roles but also for those that are in those leadership roles now could we go through some of the fundamentals of what we what we legally are expected to perform as a level one, uh, as a tier one, sorry, fire investigator? Okay, so yeah, the interesting question actually, because public perception, like say watching you know, CSI programs, things like that, but if you ask a member of the public or even members of the fire service about um, fire investigation, their expectation is the fire service would you know, clearly do fire investigation. Yeah. Um, there is no actual statutory duty for a fire and rescue service to conduct fire investigation. Um, That's the one I think is the big misnomer. Absolutely. That is colossal because yeah. it makes it doesn't make sense logically in our brains. Uh, also, no. members of the public, they th- why would you not? You're, you're the subject matter experts. You you deal with fire. You shape it. You control it. You know how it starts. You know the fire triangle. Why would you not investigate it? Absolutely. And I train across the uh, you know the UK and Europe and internationally and in some countries still. So in Ireland, it's the Garda, the police that investigate um, fires. Oh, the fire service don't that. get involved. Um, other countries as well, um, Norway, the same. Uh, it's not the fire service, it's police. And places like Dubai, UAE, uh, similar. So, yeah, so there's no statutory duty. However, fire and rescue services in the UK have powers. Um, so they can use those powers to investigate fires. Um, that's Fire and Rescue Services Act um, 2004. So there's two sections within there. And that raises the question of, well, why do we do fire investigation? Hmm. Um, and it's really about that positive contribution, you know, that common aim of reducing or preventing fires. So to actually work out cause and origin. So it's under the um, guise of safer communities. That we yeah, are. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it goes through, you know, recognizing um, dangerous processes or faults, you know, machinery and plants, processes, that sort of type of thing. Um, product design. So very much, you know, was the cause of the fire, you know, uh, an so item. What I mean, or, though, there's a really large gap in between these where lots of things could fall because if we said so let, let's 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 scenario something for me so i own let's say i own a large manufacturing company in an area of the uk where that local fire and rescue service has decided it's not their responsibility maybe they haven't got the resources the capacity the appetite whatever it may be they don't investigate fires in that area i have a large fire who am I expecting to do this? Because like you say, if it is the product, if it is a piece of machinery, that is the fault, then the manufacturer of that product will have a genuine legal requirement and also hopefully a desire to know why that. But also there is a very big elephant in the room of the blame culture and who is going to pay for this. So if I lose my factory and the local fire and rescue service is not part of their commitments to investigate this, who, I mean, obviously I'll be speaking to my insurance, but who would I be speaking to and what, what realistically could happen? Because sometimes nothing's going to happen in those situations. Surely, if if no one's really going to pick up that responsibility, where would it where would it fall? 
So, yeah, any investigation like that would be sort of two-pronged approach, really. As you said, um, the, the expectation would be the Fire and Rescue Service would investigate that and produce their, their own report and findings. But very much um, it's uh, forced to the insurance companies, and they will obviously uh, be paying out on the, the claim, but they will look at recovery, um, recovery of those costs. So the insurers will appoint a, an independent fire investigation um, through one of the big companies, Burgoynes, uh, et cetera, EFI. Do you offer those services? Do you do that for companies? Um, we do do, uh, but I do. I specialize in vehicle fire investigation predominantly. So I, I actively conduct vehicle fire investigations for um, uh, individuals or organizations. Um, okay. That's my specialist niche within fire investigation. Um, but uh, yeah, very much so um, the insurance world, um, they've got... Um, uh, Two, two avenues of investigators, really. Those that come through the academic route, they might be electrical engineers, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, and then they've learned their fire investigation skills on top of that. Um, so very good expertise in processes, machinery, electric, electronics, et cetera. Um, or you've got the experienced fire scene investigators that come through the public services that then go and, and work for those insurers. Mm -hmm. uh, that they've Pros got and the... cons to both, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a fire service investigator, public service investigator, has got uh, a vast you know, experience of fire scenes, mm -hmm. um, an understanding of fire behaviour and fire science, fire development, and they'll know the general behaviours of the emergency responders that will have probably taken place. Leading absolutely, yeah, and also the, the the absolutely, and also the persons involved. So the human reaction to fire, um, learning behaviours, how how do people react um, to fire situations? People do behave in quite an illogical way at times. Yeah, very much so. And sadly, you know, um, if it ends up as a coronial hearing following a serious injury, fatal fire, um, we can actually um, yeah, give our opinion, expert opinion on likely behaviours. Yeah, mm. Nobody can wind back the uh, the timeline and, and actually, um, you know, definitively say what was happening. But we do see those patterns of behaviour. Mm. And as you say, you know, just a simple thing of somebody sat in an armchair asleep or in bed asleep and suddenly being woken up by, say, a smoke detector. Um, instinctively, um, they tend to stand up from the chair or sit up in bed, which mm. can put their you know, respiratory system, their oronasal area straight into the smoke layers. And that's usually... Mm. We find the uh, you know the deceased you know within you know a few steps of where they would have stood up from the armchair or you know sat up in bed, um, despite you know uh, the safety training about stay below the smoke, mm -hmm. um, fresh air. It's it's not a, a, a you know a natural behaviour, especially when you compound like if it is an elderly person, yeah, they'll try and shoot straight up, and then you compound that with postural hypertension or whatever. So they've yeah. in, you know engulfed all this smoke. They're lightheaded anyway. And therefore X, Y, Z. But again, if you don't have some of that background knowledge and information and having seen things like that unfold in the past, um, you could very easily um, convince yourself down. You know, you could you could adapt the uh, the information to suit your um, sort of expectations or understanding of what you think's happened. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly in the coronial process, you know, as an expert, you are there to obviously answer questions for the coroner, um, but really you're there to give answers for the family. And that's one of the biggest things to find is that they cannot understand why their loved one didn't escape yeah. from their, their own house. They were only meters from the door. Um, yeah. yeah, they don't uh, just can't, you know, um, establish that in their minds. So we have to try and, you know, explain the, the likely behavior. Um, I remember reason. um, reading, we said before we came on, and again, I'll continue to promote this, Unnatural Causes uh, is a book by a wonderful pathologist in the UK. And one of the examples they're giving there is a woman who um, lives alone and she's found um, dead, naked uh, on the floor, quite an elderly lady. And uh, the house appears uh, ransacked and in disarray. Uh, the back door's open and all this sort of stuff. And the initial assumptions by the attending police officers is that she is um, been the victim of a sexual assault and uh, someone's robbed the house as well um, but only through the pathologists and understanding and then piecing together all this information um, she was just a lady who had no family she had a house had just run to to rack and ruin you know poor maintenance uh, low mobility unable to um, keep her house in order effectively and similar to what happens to people on Everest um, and he he led this assumption back from inspecting the body. A, there was no signs of sexual assault. There was no um, blood, sweat, semen or anything like that on the, on the body. But also it, she died of hypothermia. 
and you find this with people on Everest, apparently they start to remove their clothing um, prior to death, even though they're freezing to death. Um, and it's one of those, again, illogical things that happens to people. Um, we, we saw it again, I think, in one of the recent uh, incidents, and I'll not mention it, but somebody that died of heat exhaustion in quite a high profile fire, uh, a firefighter in the UK was found without his boots, without his helmet on and without, some, without his gloves on as well, I think. Um, and again, the mind just does very logical things when the body starts to spiral. Absolutely, and and especially with the heat stresses, um, yeah, yeah, and the confusion and the fear, definitely. Uh, um, it shows that um, it, it's predictable behaviour as an investigator, as you say, you know, learning that um, unfortunately from previous events. Uh, but that's the importance of learning: is why didn't why didn't people escape from a you know perfectly sound compartmented building um, yeah. with fire protection, etc.? Because the human element, and that's something you. You you can't you don't understand from a public perception um, unless you've had those previous experiences about um, human behaviour and fire. So take me back. Sorry, <laughs> I apologise for dragging down that rabbit hole. But the expectations of a, of a tier one fire investigator. So if you, as a privately employed investigator, imagine that the company had invented, hired you and you submitted a request to the local fire and rescue service for their tier one investigation report. What would you expect to find within that? And if you yourself were carrying out a tier one investigation through your mind back to be in an LF, what what would you do? What would we consider best practice? Uh, to be honest, Pete, this is where probably the UK system is is limited. Um, we have the National Incident Recording System. Um, so as a tier one investigator, um, you don't write a report. All you do is classify the incident in terms of um, cause and origin. Um, so it's a drop down menu on a box, um, whatever the determination is at the scene, they go back to station, sit in front of the computer and a drop down list. Um, and they sometimes make the, their hypothesis, their cause, um, fit the, the drop down list. Yep, so there's a, a, a margin of error there. Um, but in terms of requests and that information, all that, um, whether it's the, the owner of the property themselves or the insurance company, um, They've got a right to that information through the Freedom of Information Act. But actually, all they get is an extract from the IRS, and it literally is those bullet points. Um, no explanation, no narrative, no report behind it, because that's um, the requirement um, for a tier one is just to determine those those factors for national data. Um, but even that is very difficult for a lot of tier one, because again, there's this big gap of training. So it wasn't until I went onto courses and started looking at you know, how I could determine if a door was open or closed, the hinges, the burn pattern, the directional airflow, the patterns on the walls, the different colouring of carpet, and whether I could determine if an accelerant had been involved. Because again, some of the signs are counter to what you would think. Like the area of origin or the hottest area could sometimes not it's not with the blackest for 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 the common understanding of perhaps the public listener it's not it's not massively charred or anything like that if there's an area of accelerant that area might actually look very different than the area that's you know um sort of suffered the worst um fire or smoke damage 100% yeah so um let's say you're talking about post fire indicators there so yes. uh, it's the skill of the fire investigator to uh, be able to read the scene um to take all of the the testimony, the witness evidence, um, to look at the physical evidence at the scene, to use their knowledge of um, fire, fire science, fire development, how materials react in fire, um, ventilation effects, and really, um, yeah, put all that together to uh, form um, potential hypothesis. Yeah, very much it is a forensic science, and we do mm -hmm. work to scientific method, the same as any forensic scientist. Um, so it's not just that witchcraft of walking in and uh, yeah, <laughs> stroking the chin and thinking, yeah, it's def definitely been a fire. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, very much um, that scientific method, um, identify an area of interest initially, which might be, you know, a particular corner within a compartment. And then to, you know, delve into that area to identify the point of origin where we think the fire started. But again, using all those post-fire indicators, um loss of material patterning on the walls etc to to work out then what were the causes or potential causes within that point of, of origin mm. and then to basically eliminate um uh through through the process um scientifically and evidence-based eliminate the the possible causes 
uh, to form a final hypothesis and then to um, seek information, data, evidence to support that final hypothesis of cause. Mm. Um, there is always an element of most likely is a, a term that we can use if we can't definitively um, prove the cause. Uh, as an expert witness, we can give a, a most likely cause. But uh, as an investigator... Um, Not spark people... from passing locomotive then? Uh, well, that... that's... <laughs> I remember likely. that one on the, on the, on the <laughs> yeah. report. It was always... Uh, uh, and, and I think we spoke previously about myths within fire investigation, um, <laughs> and you see some some determinations and causes, yeah, based on Hollywood movies of uh, yeah. Yeah, refracted light of through the glass or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Which can and, actually genuine. I have had one of them. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's yeah, absolutely scientifically feasible in certain circumstances. So yeah, maybe the the you know the the beauty mirror inside the the window. Um, mm. But again, it has to be you know very specific um, conditions, but mm. definitely a, a possible cause. What we do see is you know community safety teams putting out messages, you know certainly in the wildfire environment about um, you know yeah. discarded glass bottles and things. And actually, that sort of makes every fire investigator wince a little bit to say, well, actually, scientifically, um, yeah, ninety nine point nine percent is unlikely that uh, yeah. that that glass uh, is happen. is very rarely used in manufacturing of like food and goods now, and often the, the glass is actually such poor quality that it wouldn't have the ability to do that. From my and please tell me I'm talking out my ass at any point if that's the case, but that's my limited understanding at the moment. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's a curvature of the angle, you know, the refraction of the the, the light, etc. But um, and the focus of that light. But it's mm. also about the viability of the fuel. So it's all well and good having an ignition source, but um, it's the viability of the the fuel to actually ignite and sustain the fire anyway as well. So mm. yeah, so um, you mentioned earlier about the the post fire indicators and and mm. to the to the lay person, um, it's not obvious. Um, but to a fire investigator, experienced, competent. Um, as you said there, the area of highest intensity burn or highest intensity heat can actually be um, white and people mm. don't understand that fact. And it's the fact that the the carbon in the smoke that's been laid down on the surfaces has then subsequently been burnt as a fuel by the mm. high intensity heat. Because for most of us, our interpretation of fire, when we, the, the strange thing is we don't really understand it, most of us. We don't have any kind of fundamental understanding of how fire works. Uh, but we've known about it since we were a child. You know, we were took to a bonfire or we had a fire in the living room and we speak about things in a way that the thing is on fire, i.e. the table's on fire, the, the bonfire's on fire, you know, the barbecue's on fire. But it's not actually that, and we're not going to go too much down fire behavior conversation here, but it's not actually the thing itself. And, and I only say this because it relates to the aspect of accelerants. The thing itself isn't on fire. So therefore, the, the the richness of the source, especially when it comes to things like accelerants, may actually exhibit very different burning or charring because we're used to seeing like a barbecue. The barbecue has been on fire and the result of the fire is there's a lump of char in the bottom of the things. Therefore, that was the origin of the fire. Yeah, 100 percent. And it's that knowledge of how fuels um, you know, are affected by heat. Uh, and like I say, it's not the fuel itself that's burning. It's being affected by heat and mm. that chemical process, pyrolyzation, mm -hmm. big technical term. But py pyrolyzation is basically the breakdown of a, a, a fuel um, when it's exposed to heat and it produces um, products, um, its base products, which then can ignite. Or you relate it to the ignitable liquid. You know, the vapors that come off of the liquid pool is is what's burning. And actually, in those circumstances, the pool of liquid may actually protect the the, the floor underneath or the carpet. So you actually hmm. end up with a an unburned area uh, of a pour pattern. It's where the liquid petrol has um, protected the the surface from the heat above. It's the vapors that are burning above. And so I've yeah, seen only even... only two or three really perfect examples. One of a gentleman who had separated from his partner and had um, set fire to the house that they'd recently bought together, and you could see the pattern. Um, as he'd walked out of the house and sloshed this material on various areas and initially we were looking at it because it then gets overlaid with the spray patterns of the crews that deploy their firefighting techniques and you can it's really fascinating but you do have to stand there for a little while to see it you know what i mean it's almost like a double take when you you stand there and you're seeing something but you need to stand there for long enough it's like a like one of those magic eye puzzles and then you see the different patterns going in different directions and start to and this is not with any chemical testing just visually seeing what must have been coming in from the door and when the door got opened versus this sloshing that I was talking about. 
comet that came round from the bedroom of origin down the hallway, down the stairs, sorry, through the hallway and uh, to the back door. And it was so very obvious once you had determined and, and differentiated it. And this is before we got in the sniffer dogs and we can go into some point about resources and tools and things like that. But I think that was one of my first experiences with a tier two uh, investigator. So maybe that's a good place for us to go now. What At what point, um, if there's a very inexperienced uh, junior officer uh, with a really rubbish watch commander who doesn't give them any guidance, is really abrupt and is about to retire in a month, hasn't given them any help. When when should tier one investigators, excuse me, be requesting the support of a tier two investigator? And what's the difference? Okay, so um, just pick up on a couple of points there. So uh, I think I'm going to use that professional term you've just used of sloshing the next time I'm in court. <laughs> <Sloshing. an expert laughs> I think that's a per- perfect description of uh, somebody um, spreading ignisable fluids. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Not, like you say, is a lot of fire investigation is about that uh, methodical approach. And you'll quite often see investigators doing as they're taught and that what we call a preliminary external and a preliminary internal um, observation. Yeah, casting your net wide enough. That's back. what somebody said to me. Yeah, yeah that People absolutely. can walk straight into Just, the house um, and go to the thing. No, because um, bias is a massive thing with inv- investigation. We've got to avoid all bias and, and we've got to, you know, factually based and evidence based um, hypothesis. So you will see uh, investigators standing back, just trying to absorb, um, yeah, the scene and thinking about what was original um, fire damage, what was That's you know, so important. Sorry to interrupt you, but people yeah. think sometimes the tier two investigators being really ignorant. Like, why don't they just come and talk to me? Because I know what's yeah, actually happened. Absolutely. But you're like, yeah. but I, I need to take my own observations before I get your bias. 100%. And that's what in, in any training for supervisory officers, etc., or crews, that crew awareness, you know, when you arrive in your car and they're stood at the car window wanting to tell you what they, they think it was caused and origin, um, then, yeah, you, you have to politely say, just give me some time. I'll have an initial look uh, yeah. and then I'll come and speak to you and, and capture your, your testimony. That's a like. difficult skill. People, people is, struggle yeah. with that because that's an interpersonal skill. Yeah, very much so. But going back to your question, yeah, to your, uh, or initial attending um, crews, um, they are essential to the, you know, the fire investigation. The the initial crews turning up, um, even firefighters, the BA crew, um, we want them to be providing us information on um, you know, physical characteristics of the building when they turned up, were the doors or windows open, any signs of forced entry. Yeah, what was where, where was the the flame and the smoke, and what what behaviour you know was it? What colour mm-hmm. was the smoke? Um, any unusual sounds um, or any people present at the scene in the early stages? Did Mate, they? Take I've done this of- with my teams, and I think it's such a useful micro teach. And I don't think people do it. Like I've worn body worn cameras at incidents. Sometimes I wasn't allowed to because our service didn't do it. But aside from that, because I only used it for training, and then I've deleted it and whatever and whatever. But so I can then go back with the crew and say, all right, job we went to last set. I want everybody to write down exactly what they saw on arrival. And then we're going to look at it together. And again, and you see this in police reports where like if you and I got into a scuffle in a very small room and they go, right, Pete, what happened? Who was there? I said, oh, it was me and Martin. And he just came at me. And they go, was anybody else in the room? No, it was just Martin. He was, And then you see back in the footage and there was two people stood in the room with you. You know, and, and it's little things like that where your mind just fills in all the blanks through assumptions because your your mind likes to have a clear picture, doesn't it? Absolutely. So it just yeah. fills in the blanks with assumptions all the time. Yeah, hundred percent, and and fully recognizing, yeah, those first attending crews, their priorities always, yeah, save life and and fight fire. Um, but then you'd be amazed at the amount of information you take in subconsciously. And yeah. it's it's a, a, again a skill of the investigator is um, yeah obtaining evidence from witnesses, interviewing techniques, um, being able to get the best information from people um, mm. without them even sort of recognizing that they had that information in the first place. Yeah. Um, aspect, did you ever receive any formal training on open questions and interview skills? Because I I don't think that exists either. You know. Oh yeah, definitely. As certainly as a tier two fire investigator, it's part of the sort of career path of training. Um, okay, good uh, for well services that invest in in you know fire investigation training some just send people on a practical course and it's one of those this skills i mean because some people look at that as a soft well it is a soft skill and they just focus on hard skills you know i need you to have a qualification in x and you need to know how yeah. to use the detection identification monitoring kit you know what i mean but they don't they, often most of the damage and all of the errors can be done through poor soft skills you know they, they eventually get Absolutely. to question somebody yeah. and only ask closed questions 
No, that's right. Yeah, and that's the risk. Yeah, you know, with the national um, sort of competency framework for fire investigations, it basically says you know tier one trained to skills justice level two, and tier five um, to level three. Uh, sorry, level five um, fire investigation. Level five. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the basic qualification. Um, it's learning, you know, the scientific method, the practical skills, application. Um, you then need to learn. Yeah, we do courses in legal, so a level seven equivalent to masters in APA EWE, so it's expert witness uh, evidence. Um, and as you say, within oh, I'd that, love to go is, on that course. Oh, it's, it's yeah, it's fantastic because it, again, it's about um, yeah, the legal aspects of obtaining evidence and then also reporting it and presenting it in court as well. Um, which is another fascinating area to to talk about in a moment, maybe. But um, the um, skill set of interviewing people. Cognitive behavioural interviewing, um, you know, get, getting the best out of the, the information as possible and without leading them at all, because uh, obviously if this can be evidence based for a criminal investigation, um, mm -hmm. your questioning cannot, you know, be leading uh, or or in fact, you know, things like hearsay, um, you can't include anything that's potentially hearsay. Mm. Um, but certainly for the recognition of the teams, uh, the firefighters, you know, during their firefighting, although we fully recognize that they're, you know, they're to save lives and fight fire, we just, what we call sympathetic firefighting is to recognize when the scene could be suspicious, um, to try and preserve the scene, um, use sympathetic firefighting methods, um, to not destroy evidence. Um, and, uh, to what be very an open. example of that, sorry. So jets of water, for example, um, going in, and uh, certainly when I joined, you know, thirty years ago, the the, the senior we just hand, washed it down the road. Yeah, basically, yeah, <laughs> jets knocking down the plasterboard from the ceiling with a jet of water, um, you know, and then even going into overhaul and you know, mm. ceiling hook and pulling down plasterboard. That's where all our post fire indicators are and all our patterns. You've got to imagine fire investigation in America must be a right nightmare with oh, the greatest respect because yeah. yeah. they empty the bay at most incidents and it's just a different uh, firefighting absolutely. technique i'm not saying it's better or worse but from a fire investigation perspective it's probably nigh on impossible yeah 100 percent. um so yeah we, we try and educate I, I used to deliver crew awareness yeah just going talking to crews about um, the operational sort of phase of the incident um and it's things like that is you know don't uh you know turf all the evidence out onto the driveway they think they're doing the best thing for the occupant yeah we'll clean it out for you um aid recovery but uh, and also things like isolating utilities, you know, yeah, they're tasked with turning off water, gas, electricity. Yeah. But for a fire investigator, certainly the electric distribution boards, yeah, you know, if we go turn up to look at them and every single circuit breaker has been switched off, yeah. we've lost that yeah, evidence. Yeah. We can actually I always read say to people about you know, take a photo, then write on a china graph which one you've you've done, and then take a photo after it. Use the camera that's on the pump and all that sort of jazz. But even that is can still be very weak. Um, evidence yeah. i would imagine for you absolutely yeah i mean perfect for us yeah in terms of abnormal electrical activity we can read the board um to see whether it's cause or effect from the fire um if we turn up and that's been lost yeah we we can only document that through testimony of the firefighter if they can remember what they switched off so yeah education is a massive part in terms of how they can support and assist the, the and also stopping lucky lose especially with fatals you know, we always go, oh, we've got so-and-so with us. He's a new recruit. Do you mind if we just go and have a quick look? Oh, and yeah, just 100%. having those tourists um, is a real bugger for when it comes to investigation, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and especially with um, serious injury or fatalities is obviously the yeah, the impact of those events. Um, BA crews, you know, generally go in and breathing apparatus into a severe fire. They discover a fatality. Yeah, they, they firefight, withdraw and leave the scene. So the exposure is quite minimal. Uh, and exactly as you said there, why do we send people back in or encourage them yeah. to go and have a look? Yeah, it's an experience. We, you don't need those adverse no. exposures, really. Um, Even and it's, from it's, a mental health and trauma perspective, yeah, I don't think it's healthy. No, absolutely not. No, yeah, we come across enough trauma in our careers, repeated exposure through road traffic collisions, et cetera. Um, you know, house fires and fire fatalities are one that um, we can control exposure in a way. Mm. Um, and it's an interesting point, actually, you know, for fire investigators um, about the you know, cumulative emotional load over the years of dealing with, you know, sadly, um, you know, serious injuries and fatalities. But it's recognising that um, whereas a um, scene of crimes, you know, crime scene investigator might be encouraged to go in and document a scene, they are actually trained to not associate with the casualty, um, mm. to just literally go and process the scene. And yeah. there's um, trauma training to sort of make sure that you don't get attached to the the individual or the family. 
Well, this Whereas, is something again, Dr. Richard Shepard, and I don't want to spoiler alert for people, but he speaks about in his, this is after, well, to the point where he was starting to retire and he owned his own firm for forensics. He had quite a severe um, mental breakdown um, related to that cumulative effect of trauma. And he speaks a lot about the Marchioness where they had to remove the hands of the victims through further, because there was a piece of equipment that they couldn't transport and it was the only form of identification they had left for these individuals. So they had to cut the hands off all of the people and then they got sewn back onto the wrong bodies and things like this. And there was that. And then the um, the incident uh, of oh, the gentleman that killed uh, many people in the village and then killed his mom. Um, it's going to escape me. But that was one of the first instances. It was only when he was flying over it. He learned to be a pilot later on in his life. And he was flying over the area where it had happened. Um, and he had a, a horrific breakdown. Um, and these things can be very, very cumulative. And some people think that distancing yourself from these incidents could make you seem slightly psychopathic or sociopathic. And there may be tendencies there that make you better at a job or a certain profession. Um, but I think that's also a bit of a harsh accusation, in all honesty. Um, there can be more strategic ways of just limiting people's exposure, similar to what we're talking about there, of just actively discouraging people from you know, exposing themselves to these things when they don't need to. Yeah, and within the fire investigation world, it comes right back to selecting individuals for uh, to become fire scene investigators. Um, things are improving, and that recognition of um, yeah the the individual psychology and previous um, sort of exposures. So I think there's a definite need to to get the right type of person uh, into forensic services, or the opposite is to to avoid anybody that's unsuitable for that role um, because of their emotional state, etc. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble with fire investigators is um, you can't disassociate with a casualty because you, part of your investigation is understanding their, their the way they live, their human behaviours, yeah. uh, their backgrounds. You investigate their social media. Um, you get um, you have to interview the family. Um, you know, you're looking at how they live. Um, you are becoming a very um, you know in depth analysis of their lives. Yeah. And then not only then at the scene and going through obviously the physical aspects of body recovery, documenting documenting the body, recovering, etc. But then also then writing reports, reviewing photographs, and yeah. at some point later, probably a few weeks or even months later, is attending coroner's court to actually present all that evidence again. So revisiting it. Um and also doing that in front of the family, which is, you know. Um, so as a fire fire scene investigator, you, know, you do become very immersed uh, in the the individual. Um, and because there's also a big element. Whilst, whilst there's no um, crimes that sit innocent of that person's psychological stress, you you just throw dying in a fire or drowning or or anything else. There's a tremendous element of helplessness to it, isn't there? There's, a, there's an element of this. You can see as the as the story unfolds how this person began to lose hope or you know the waves were rising or they began they realized they were trapped and they realized they weren't going to get out. You you kind of recognize at one point of the growth of the fire or whenever they woke up or whenever something happened, that was the point where the child or the person was never going to get out. Yeah, absolutely. And and part of the coronial process, as a as an expert witness attending that hearing. You are there to provide, you know, some answers. Um, you are under sworn oath, so you can't, um, uh, yeah, you, know, you have to choose your words very carefully when the family are there because their their one interest is, you know, um, is did did my loved one suffer? Is yeah. always the question. Um, and you you obviously have to tell the truth about the fire behaviour and what they would have been experiencing, but obviously in in very soft words. Um, but the fact is, you know, the only reassurance we can give people is is quite often. Um, the smoke, obviously, that would um, yeah. cause um, the, the death. Um, and the fact that uh, on occasions, especially in the middle of the night, if people were asleep, they'd, they'd be t totally unaware of the fire. The smoke would, um, you know, carbon monoxide, et cetera, would have its effect. So a lot yeah. of fire fatalities, you can reassure the family to say they, they probably were blissfully unaware. Um, or even, you know, they, they perceive them being engulfed in flames, Whereas very most likely it's the early smoke inhalation. Mm. It only takes a few. They have the seconds. image of someone being burnt at the stake. I think. Yes. Yeah. yeah very much so. Burning. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, which is and, and that's not to say, obviously, we get um, instances where individuals, you know, either douse themselves in ignitable liquid or they become yeah. engulfed in flame. Um, that's a totally different dynamic and, you know, is a very traumatic event. But majority of fire deaths, we can hopefully reassure the family that they, they wouldn't have suffered, um, you know, certainly um, to the point that they'd they'd envisaged. Um, and that's the important phase of the coronial process, I think, you know, as an expert is providing that that knowledge and, and reassurance. So if you could, I know we spoke a little bit there around some common unconscious errors that those initial crews are accidentally doing, i.e. tourism and things like that. But if I could ask you to just again articulate or list some of the common errors or the common myths or some of the key principles that people could do on initial attendance of a fire to best support the process of investigation. Absolutely. Um, yeah, hundred percent. This is the purpose of the sort of crew awareness sessions we do, etc. But um, they're the eyes and ears in the early stages. So anything they see, hear, perceive, um, anything they do as well, note their actions and be open and honest. If they move something, tell the investigator. We can discount it. Um, but so to be specific really... about how that. So it, it, we talk. We're talking like as soon as you've come out and decontaminated, contemporaneous notes and held on the fire um, appliance yeah, so do it as soon or as late when they go back station or the next few days when would you suggest people be doing this so um certainly as an investigator um any evidence anything's recorded even if it's written on the back of a you know fag packet it's di- disclosable so we have to be careful in terms of um contemporaneous notes etc but certainly as an investigator I'd, I'd be wanting to speak to that breathing apparatus crew um at the scene um while it's fresh in their memory um to get the initial information from them um, but that's not always the best information. Um, we've uh, certainly in my service, we we did a pro forma, just four key areas of what was their role, responsibility, what actions did they take, um, what did they see here, etc. And it sort of gives them a structure to answer to. Um, too many occasions when you speak to number two of the BA team and you say, "What did you see? What was the fire doing, etc.?" Mm-hmm. and they come back with a response of saying, "Well, I was number two. I was just following number one and managing the hose." And you, yeah. but when you start probing, um, yeah, you know, it's a skill set again of getting that best information from somebody. Um, so definitely, um, at the scene, and then what we'd usually do is either follow them back to the station or yeah, the next shift, and actually sit with them and and again you use that interview technique to to get the best information from them. Um, so yeah, it's always even with a homeowner is initial conversation with them, um, but then um, a further you know more thorough um. Uh, interview if you like um to get the best information from them more in a structured way but and how about for of... the uh, incident commander in terms of cordons because this was a lesson that i learned in a bad way um very early on in my career about when we sometimes just put a bit of tape over our perceived room of origin um where should we be th- when we're thinking about preserving a scene what should be some of our considerations Okay, so uh, the first thing we say is, and it's always you know, hard to put this into practice sometimes, but uh, every scene should be treated as potentially criminal until proven otherwise. So every house fire, every car fire, you know, if we're in that mindset to preserve evidence, preserve the scene, if it doesn't become, um, you know, if it's purely accidental, happy days, we've we've done the best, we've you know, protected the scene, we can take the, the cordons down. But certainly um, treat it as, um, you know, potential crime scene. Um, so either a fire service cordon, um, but we know that that doesn't hold any sort of legal weight to all the crews, you know, quite happily duck under and in and out from the yeah. cordons. But this is about um, working with the police um, to put a scene guard on and a definite cordon and a gateway, as it's called, so that anybody, we restrict the access and egress to that site. Um, we control who goes in and out. And we, we literally are looking for maximum preservation of the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of IICs, yeah, the earlier that cordon can happen, the better. Um, as I say, the the practical elements for the crews, um, not washing away, you know, soot patterns on the walls, um, to not break windows for ventilation, just open mm. them and record, you know, whether they were open or closed. But as soon as they break glazing, yeah, you know, we've lost um, soot deposition and patterns on the windows. Mm. Um, yeah, look, don't touch is the key thing. Um, if you do end up moving something during firefighting or, or rescue. Yeah, we want to know about that and we can, um, you know, restructure the fire fire scene afterwards, uh, rebuild it. We can place furniture back in its original positions. Um, but from a, uh, also the um, contamination of the scene. So fire and rescue scenes, uh, very much we found, uh, you know, well, every job basically you find um, disposed nitrile gloves and bottled water and cups. 
um, standard really file. So it's, That's uh, just a behavioural right. thing. So easy not yeah. to do that. Absolutely, yeah. In fact, one, what well, I won't allude to the circumstances, but it was a double fatal fire. Um, there's a long driveway um, and very sadly, um, two young people lost their lives. Um, and we were there three or four days investigating this with um, yeah, the complete um, police team, CID, um, yeah, disaster victim identification officers, etc. And it was about the third day when um, all intents and purposes, this this was looking like an accidental fire. And uh, the the police officer that was on the scene guard at the top of the driveway, he walked down on the third day and he mentioned to us that he'd picked up some litter, went to put it in the wheelie bin that was at the top of the drive. And there was a strong smell of, in his terms, petrol. And there were some rags in the bottom of the uh, the wheelie bin. Uh, and straight away, it was that moment where everybody just stopped thinking, yeah. my God, you know, could this be criminal? Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, it took a long process um, to establish what crews had been there over the sort of 48 hours of um, yeah, relief crews and pumps changing around. Uh, anyway, uh, eventually got to the point, speaking to the crew, they basically refilled the petrol generator in the locker uh, with petrol sometime during it, the night um, for lighting. And they spilled petrol into the bottom of the locker and used the rags to soak up the petrol and then turn around and disposed of them in the, the property's wheelie bin. Mm. So it's just one of those things we, we could but even that, it. you know, that sounds not, I mean, it doesn't sound innocent, but it does. But like, even that, if you wanted to go down that rabbit hole even further, they would have to sample the rag and then go and sample the pump on the fire engine to, to, to match them as well. And every vessel that you discard, we talk about throwing away bottles has to be accounted for and, and, and discounted and tested sometimes depending on the nature of the incident, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. We we have to discount everything, um, whether it's a footprint in the scene. Uh, yeah, we relate that to a standard sort of issue fire fire boot. Um, whether it, like say DNA on on cups and bottles. Um, yeah, absolutely. We we have to document that and discount it um, to show that that wasn't a factor. Yeah, if this go- is a criminal case and it goes to court, um, yeah, you have to discount everything to stop that um, opportunity for the defence to cast doubt on the on mm. the investigation. I wanted to move now on a correlated trend. And again, some of this we may have already covered, but we spoke about seeing examination, but I know in our notes together, we spoke about data, photography, scanning, evidence recovery, vehicle identification. Um, could you take me into any areas there that you think perhaps we haven't given voice to yet? Yeah, I mean, that's the essential scene. It's all right investigating these scenes and uh, coming up with your hypothesis, but uh, you, you know, the documentation of the scene, reporting and presenting that evidence is a, a key, you know, key part of the investigation so whether it's um uh witness information testimony and that could be from the the responders the police fire and ambulance can be from bystanders or the property owners um getting that best uh, witness evidence if you like um cctv and the, you know actually the the blessing of ring doorbells now give you fantastic coverage of, oh um, i love mine yeah, it's great scenes. yeah so you'll quite often see an investigator disappearing up the road and uh, door knocking and trying to obtain you know, the CCTV and door, door yeah. ring bell coverage. Because uh, depending on how big your to... drive is and depending on how you've adjusted yours, it goes off every time someone walks past the drive. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Or the sort of fisheye, you know, large, large 180 degree sort of coverage. And and it can even support your hypothesis. You can see early fire development, you know, which window did the, the smoke or the fire come out of, you know, explosions, things like that. Anything, um, or like say a third party, you know, somebody leaving the scene hurriedly mm-hmm. um but it's essential information that's um can be gained so yeah there's a skill set in um even looking at cctv and um and documenting the evidence you know that you retrieve from how that. could you use so for example then you the fire across the road you come to my house and you say pete you've got a ring doorbell can we you can we have the footage so that just lives on my phone to my understanding i don't know if ring the company have their own database that you can request it from how would that work? Would it be, you know, because when you present this evidence, it has to hold weight, doesn't it? So Absolutely. me just what recording it off my phone and sending it to you on WhatsApp, you know, how how would that process actually work and and hold weight? Yeah, so certainly um, any electronic device, things like that, uh, the police have got specialist digital investigation teams and you'd be amazed at um, the digital evidence that can be retrieved from any uh, any electrical item, basically, whether it's GPS in a car or a phone or or um, re- yeah, doorbell in this case. But um, yeah, that data is held um, you know, centrally. Um, it's accessible. 
the, what we have to do as investigators is that, um, like say, admissibility of that evidence, how it's captured, how it's um, recorded, the the custody of that, um, the chain of custody of that um, evidence mm. until it's presented in court. So we have to be very careful that then uh, that's managed and handled in the correct way, same as a piece of physical evidence, um, so that uh, it's admissible to court and also there's no opportunity for the defence uh, to challenge that uh, evidence. I think it's harder to tamper with electronic evidence, I would imagine, but please tell me if I'm wrong. But yeah, physical evidence, I think, is something that we often lay ourselves down with because a lot of fire stations and places, I mean, most services probably have a central location where they can record and and safely hold that piece of evidence. But I think in most cases, it gets taken back to the fire station and put in a watch room. Um, and that probably becomes useless then, I imagine. Oh, yeah, so certainly discourage any any anything leaving scene other than that's captured by the scene of crimes, basically. So as a fire investigator, very rarely, um, you know, um, gather evidence, uh, physical evidence. We That's where we work. You know, tier two is very much a multi-agency, uh, you know, complex investigation. So I would, um, you know, use a, a crime scene investigator, uh, SOCO, as, you know, old terms, scene of crimes officer to process that scene. I'd tell them items I'm interested in um, and we'd document that, photograph it, measure it, et cetera. And then they would actually process it in terms of, okay. um, you know, uh, seizing that evidence, um, packaging it appropriately, labeling it and that chain of uh, chain of custody. Um, certainly we'd uh, discourage fires, fires crews or fire officers or uh, even fire investigators from removing that from the scene um, mm. unless it's done through the appropriate means, if you like. Is there anything else there we'd like to cover? Because I'd love to, I know it wasn't necessarily part of our original conversation, but I'd love to change gears and explore some of your specialism with required uh, with regard to vehicle investigation, if we could. Yeah, 100%. And just to go on from that term, documenting the scene, you know, very much uh, it's about um, you know, interviewing techniques, it's about measurements, sketch drawings, photographing, and that's really been the sort of way of documenting scenes um, mm. up until modern times. But we're definitely seeing introduction of 360 imaging, um, 3D scanning, photogrammetry. Yeah. And these are all methods where we can rapidly capture a scene. Um, and rather sitting, looking at stills photographs, trying to interpret them, we can later on during our, our report writing, et cetera, we can re-immerse ourselves in that, that scene. Um, we've got 3D scans of rooms, compartments, buildings, vehicles, um, but also uh, to support training. Um, mm. It's you know one one scene is is very valuable, um, and if we can capture that and use it, you know, in yeah, that's where the reality, VR technologies really lends itself well to this uh, this aspect of our role, isn't it? Hundred percent, yeah. And as you say, yeah, an area I specialize in and deliver training in is vehicle fire investigation. Um, every burn we do now, because of the environmental impact, we yeah we want to limit the number of vehicles we burn, etc. But um, we we capture those now, three D scanning, um, photo photogrammetry, three D three sixty imaging, um, to to make best use of that, and we turn it into um, training material. Um, work very co yeah co closely with um, a few of the key companies and working with Reva. Mm -hmm. um, to look at putting the fire investigation content um, onto their their equipment and the headsets, so that yeah, remote audiences can immerse themselves in that scene as if they were stood around the vehicle, um, and provide that information for other parties as well. So you know, vehicle manufacturers that want to investigate the cause and origin of the vehicle fire, uh, and product safety, product design, etc. So yeah, hundred percent technology. I think is that's where massive. some of the biggest vested interest is, because whilst we, as members of the public and members of the emergency services, perhaps think that the greatest motivation is to save saveable life, which probably is still the case, there is also a massive corporate risk for manufacturers if unknowingly the resultant of their manufacturing process or the materials used or the way they were put together has been a contributing factor to an accident and or a fire. Yeah, absolutely. And that takes us right back to why do we do fire investigation? And it is to reduce future fires. Um, and if that's involving a product, um, yeah, is to make sure that that product, uh, yeah, recall might might occur. Um, but product redesign, product safety, just to prevent further fires in the future. Um, so that's a real key driver of fire investigation is to seek that, um, you yeah, know, improvement. Um, and also, yeah, it crosses not just um, items and, and products, it's also building materials, construction methods. 
yeah, we've obviously seen tragic fires occurring with um, modern building constructions, um, and it's learning about oh, how yeah. those the, the ongoing tumultuous investigations of places like Grenfell and they're my words, not yours, um, really have shone a tremendous light on the fire investigation community and fire safety community and audits and inspections of buildings and assumptions of materials used and whether or not they were done purely for cost savings and whether true considerations were made to the resultant effects of these on compartmentation and you know fire resistance and things like that absolutely and that's uh you know the reason that fire investigators is um, the need for continuous professional development we need to be constantly learning about new new materials because in our world they're fuels so we need to know how they they are uh, you know um uh, react in a fire mm. uh, what products uh, fuels are they going to contribute to the fuel loading but also the construction method in terms of um, yeah the orientation of that fuel the ventilation um, and you've seen it yeah a lot of the fire investigation is not necessarily yeah, it's partly at the scene but then we go away and do research and we might do test burns at facilities on different materials mm. um, different fire spread um, you know to, to understand how that product or that construction method has affected the fire development mm. uh, is it as we expected it would have been or has it behaved differently for some reason so yeah you quite often you see fire investigators at um, various burn facilities um, spending the day burning you know, sort of uh, different <laughs> samples and materials and and it's just that constant learning process yeah. um, but yeah definitely the need for that continuous professional development it's it's not a subject where you can just qualify in and 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 that's it for your career it's uh, no. a continuous improvement I'd be remiss if we moved on to vehicle fire investigation, electrical vehicle fire investigation, without first, and it just reminded me there, addressing the aspect of uh, contaminants, because I think this has been one of the, I mean, it's been over uh, overlooked in just the fire and rescue service in general, but also the effects on other first responders, you know, police, ambulance, and then finally, but no, no less so important, the fire investigation officers, you know, when they're arriving on scenes, there's very much this, in my own personal experiences, behavior that the the fire's out. Do you know what I mean? The hazard's gone. So we're just here to look now, look and investigate. And I and I shudder at the amount of damage and ill effect of people's personal health and welfare that's been done to investigating officers, both police and fire, in visiting and investigating scenes that are continuing to present um carbonaceous hazards. Yeah, and having come to the end of a thirty-year career, yeah, you start reflecting back exactly that, Pete, and you think about the yeah the effects of uh, exposure over your career. But um, it is improving. Uh, it's a key message um, that awakening uh, to contaminants across the fire and rescue service or other re or responders. But in terms of fire investigation, um, it is the you know the emergency phase is finished, but then the investigative phase. We still need to be ensuring you know maximum um, protection for the investigators. Um, and like I say, it's the unseen products of um, combustion that are still you know, present at that scene. I don't know, it but might I mean, fall like a ball ache. I know it's you know awkward and annoying to wear these respirators and people feel like they limit them and they're uncomfortable. But as you begin to disturb and move things, the amount of, of carcinogenic material you're kicking up into the atmosphere is colossal. If you could see it, like like we see heat in a thermal imaging camera, if you could physically see the particulates, and I think the Fire Brigade Union did some great visuals in terms of you know if if we could see these things how apparent it would be and it really does really does give me cause because concern I, i'm really i'm just like wincing as i think about the um illnesses that may show themselves over the next five or ten years for people approaching retirement yeah absolutely and and it's that um the fact and the, the fire investigator you'll often see us on our knees you know basically doing archaeological dig we're removing layers of fire debris literally with a trowel and a brush um, we're creating sort of particulate um, it, um it's the perfect scenario sort of projection just getting right down there in it and and just dragging it all up into yeah. your face isn't it yeah and ultimately that's our, our task you know in that scientific method is then a detailed examination of the interior we are getting down to that point of origin we might be digging down through several feet of you know fire debris um removing large debris from the top that rafters beams etc working right the way down and in that process, we're not only releasing particulates, but as you said, they're fire gases uh, th and nasty stuff like hydrogen cyanide. There can be pockets of you know uh, vapors and, and gases mm. that uh, are trapped within that fire debris. And we're knelt on our hands and knees, you know, very much uh, exposed to that. 
but you know and yeah you know, it crept in and you know p3 particulate masks paper masks disposable masks initially but you will quite often now see, you know, as as rightly so, fire investigators in full, um, you know, ventilated masks, etc., um, yeah. full face. But also all of their kit and the the notebooks and you know the dictaphones and yeah. they cut they travel alone. They get there, all the stuffs in the boot of the car, or they've got a nice Gucci van. But still, it it becomes a massive behavioural thing because it is a frustration to have to yeah. go back to a different location to get a new set of kit or to. Absolutely, you have yeah. to sacrifice your notepad that you've yeah. made all your notes on and trans, you know, transpose them to s- something else. It's it really can become so time consuming. And, and absolutely, you might have been on scene for you know hours and hours or even days. Um, and that's the that's only one part of the fire investigation. That's the scene examination, mm. and yeah, you, know, you haven't necessarily because you're wrapped up in PPE. You spend long hours in there. Maybe don't hydrate or eat as you know as you should do um because you don't want to come out go through a deep clean and you know um decontamination process to to then have to get re to go back in so at the end of the incident when you go back to your vehicle as you said um there's that temptation just to you know throw everything into the vehicle um but we need to, to make get back sure that... you want to see the kids before they go to yeah. sleep it's so and so's party or, or, johnny needs to yeah. go away this weekend or, or in fact, you know, um, to go back and interview crews at the station, or to start your report writing, you know, download your photographs. There's, yeah, endless stuff. The the one good thing we've got a new ISO standard coming in into the criminal investigation world. Yes, ISO please, please unfold that for us. Yeah, so ISO seventeen oh two oh. This is where it would have a positive effect on the matters we've just been mentioning about contamination. Um, the whole purpose of the ISO standard is to ensure anybody investigating in the criminal justice system, um, the quality of evidence being presented. And part of that is um, avoiding cross-contamination. So uh, there must be a process for decontamination, uh, cross-contamination avoidance. And it does come down to you know protective equipment being worn, to the the dressing process, the the de-rigging process, but also storage um, in vehicles. There, there needs to be dirty areas, clean areas. Um, like say, every time we touch something within the scene, we should be changing our gloves. Um, so rightly so for criminal investigations, it ensures the quality of um, evidence. But yes. within that, um, although it is um, for more experienced investigators that are now facing that... Um, what they would term as bureaucracy um that's not the way i've worked i've done it for 20 years um but reality is it's it's uh, you know beneficial for certainly for the cross contamination and and the contamination of the investigator as well um yeah many a time i've you know as you said as a responding officer kit goes in the boot of the car you think you've cleaned it down as best you can do at the scene very limited sort of you know mobile resources mm. um you go get back in the vehicle the next day and yeah you, know, you immediately smell um, yeah <laughs> absolutely and that's not just a smell that that is contaminant basically so yeah um yeah so i think we're heading in the right direction in terms of um contamination uh, control and cross contamination avoidance um all for the right reasons but this is where it comes down to maybe you know we spoke again briefly about sort of you know leadership change within the fire and rescue service is recognizing the the forensic role uh, of fire investigation mm. understanding why we do it and closing that loop to actually use the the findings to inform community risk and safety but recognizing the impact on the investigator both um we said about the mental health emotional mm. load but that's the unseen sort of contaminant if you like um but also the physical resources that are required in terms of uh, it's often a real bottleneck equipment. isn't it services there there's maybe one or two um, you know, lead fire investigators in services of eight, nine hundred operational staff. Yeah, very much so. Um, and uh, yeah, within my service at Hereford Worcester, I, at the end of my my last two years, I became the lead for Hereford Worcester and Shropshire uh, in terms of the ISO seventeen oh two project. Wow. Um, and yeah, looking at training and provision. But I, I was a group commander, reporting up into the principal management team. And yeah, on one particular investigation I had um, that was yeah double fatality etc. Um, I had a, a principal officer say to me, his actual words were, "I never realised you got involved with all that." Um, yeah, recovering the body, oh. going to coroner's court. Um, yeah, so the, a complete lack of organisational understanding or, or acknowledgement mm. about the role potentially. Um, and, and again, yeah. that speaks that echoes back right back to the beginning of our career. With the greatest respect to that principal officer, if they have only ever had an operational career to certain romantic mindsets they'll go oh, that makes them for the best 
you know, CFO because they've doing, they've been there and done it. Yeah, yeah, okay, they've been there and done it, but they haven't travelled the landscape of fire and rescue services, and again, had that holistic view of the importance of each independent component of what is now their legal responsibility as a principal officer. Absolutely, yeah, and there's a massive onus on the investigator. You know, if you're summoned to court or to coroners, um, you are there as an individual. Um, but however, you know. Uh, vicarious liability of the organization mm. um yeah i've been to many a time too many times been to court you know crown court high court or coroner's court and the organization doesn't even recognize that you're there um no. that you're representing no support the, service. the cognitive load and stress yeah, that that brings on yeah. that individual yeah. but also the potential for that individual fire investigator um if you were found um you know to be um uh you know derelict in your duties as an expert witness uh, there's actual individual sanctions you know you, you could be um yeah, contempt of court or um mm. you could be struck off um your professional um bodies yeah. etc so there is a you know an onus on the individual uh that uh, legal responsibility as well mm. um but yeah for, in, my, most important for me is the recognition of the organization in terms of the emotional load um for investigators um recognizing the it's not just a task and finish um sort of role um yeah get back to the day job it can take days weeks months even um for some of these cases to go through um and you might be juggling caseload you know several different um uh, cases at once but so for me it's that um regular um support decompression is the term in terms of mental health you know dealing with that emotional load trying to to reduce it um, manage it how would you practically um, advise new fire investigators moving into this side of their profession to, to deal with that and i don't want to delve too far into to your own personal circumstances but is there any lessons tips tricks practical approaches or techniques that people should consider implementing on a daily weekly yep. monthly basis yeah, absolutely, and and every individual investigator will have, have their own you know previous exposures and and sort of um yeah resilience, personal resilience. Um, but um, potentially they they don't know what they don't know yet. They don't know what they're going to come across and and witness. Um, your know, firefighters charity's got a good tagline. I wish my mind could forget what my eyes have seen. Mm. Um. And it's very much about um, using that support mechanism. But the I think the police, the forensic services, have got this um, right. Um, the right direction um, through police care. They are recognising that, that um, as an investigator in the forensic world, at the start of your career, you're vulnerable because you don't know, you know, how to deal with uh, what you're going to see. Yeah. Um, during your your service, there should be periodic, and we're talking, in, yeah, regular, quarterly, six monthly decompression, uh, and that's with an expert, you know, dealing with the the emotional load. But then also at the end of the career, yeah, we've got investigators of thirty years of exposure walking out of the service uh, and the big question of you know what support is there for those individuals mm. um yeah you mentioned about the the forensic um science uh, author mm. yeah flying over the scene um and it triggering an event yeah we don't know when that's going to happen um so it's really important that uh, i think for any new investigators say you know um take on that uh, offer of support if it is there if it's mm. not there go and seek it um, and Certainly to get for that. managers who are perhaps uh, looking after departments that include those individuals, especially because again, sometimes you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I spent the last um, sort of five or six years in the service, really trying to champion. Um, I think um, you know traumatic trim teams and cyst um, teams were being formed for operational crews. Um, the excellent service providing that um, decompression from routine fire fire events and RTCs, etc. Um, but the fire investigators were being missed a little bit. And again, that lack of understanding about what we did actually do in terms of, you know, recovering bodies and investigations mm -hmm. and attending coroner's courts, et cetera. So certainly within my service, um, raises the profile of that. And yeah, through the welfare team, uh, we use buddies. Um, so welfare buddies, so a trained member of the, the welfare team, yeah, would come and uh, attend our CPD events, for example, uh, quarterly and sit in and just have that general chat with us and, try and do some team uh, decompression mm. um but very much you know individuals uh, depending on the scenes or the investigations that you you work on can have um you know that cumulative effect that that needs to be managed really i absolutely agree and again we've learned those lessons through um members of fire control and things like that and people that live on the periphery of that trauma but is no less 
traumatic because they also don't have the context in which to place it sometimes. Absolutely. I want to change gears. I also want to be very respectful of your time. Are you okay on time? No problem at all, Pete. Yeah. Fantastic. I'd love to change gears, if you excuse the pun, and uh, move into some of the vehicle um, uh, investigation side of things, because obviously we've seen a tremendous explosion in the use of alternative fuels, electric vehicles, and it is very much... Uh, we've had Dr. Paul Christensen on the podcast, who's a very uh, knowledgeable, fascinating individual when it comes to the technical aspects of lithium-ion batteries. There's only one single example of alternative fuels. I'd love for you to, if you could, begin to paint the landscape of alternative fuels, what that looks like, what uh, operational crews are experiencing these days, and some of the challenges it presents us with. Absolutely. So... Within my fire investigation role, um, I went on a, a vehicle fire investigation course, and it, uh, the guy delivering that was a, a colleague I knew from 25 years ago in Surrey, um, Richard Baker, as he was then. He's now Richard Dunbar. Um, and Richard's he, been... He, um, yeah, he's on my list to have a chat with Yeah, Richard. absolutely. Yeah, do so. He's semi-retired now, but he can't stay out of the industry, so he's uh, uh, constantly researching and writing papers, <laughs> etc. Um, but yeah, so I re- re-hooked up with Richard uh, um, probably about uh, four years ago. And uh, he was delivering the International Vehicle Fire Investigation course, which is in its 23rd year. So a very established course. And uh, it's not focused on fire and rescue uh, investigators. It's um, it's across the sectors. So it trains um, uh, loss adjusters, insurance assessors, um, vehicle manufacturers, uh, engineers that look at these vehicles post-fire or explosion uh, mm-hmm. learning. Um, police, scene of crimes, and obviously fire scene investigators. So uh, it's a very established um, course. Um, I went on that course and very much um, teamed back up with Richard again at Park Lodge International. Um, and uh, Richard was uh, you know, seeking to uh, uh, drift off into semi-retirement. Um, so I've actually taken over that delivery of that course now uh, under the uh, Park Lodge International banner um, and my Phoenix Forensic Service provider so delivering those courses um, internationally, um, as I say, the focus is on in, how does a, an alternative fuel vehicle or EV, um, electric vehicle, affect fire behavior and the post scene uh, evidence? And how does that affect the vehicle fire investigation and identification? Um, we've got a couple of subject matter experts supporting us in that. Um, again, a retired expert from Scotland, um, Ian, that uh, is a you know, stolen vehicles identification expert. Um, so it's about um, uh, understanding how these modern vehicles and their fuel types um, affect fire and the subsequent investigation. Um, with alternative fuels, we're seeing you know, gaseous systems, so liquefied natural gas, compressed natural gas, hydrogen, um, ammonia even coming in now and things like that, um, aside from the electrification. So Do you all see of these the continued growth of some of those other aspects because we're all falling head over heels into EV. But I'm not entirely convinced if that is the most economical, environmental, or even most efficient um, method. And I, I'm not, you know, tempting you to go down the rabbit hole of uh, art, um, academic because you may very well lose me very quickly. But um, I just think this happens to be the place that we have put the most um, corporate money behind. Do you know what I mean? This has just yeah. been the part that we that's just been most commercially viable. Um, through capitalism for us to invest so heavily within it hence why we're seeing the proliferation of it but i don't could, could you could you take us into a few of the, the other areas hydrogen example being one of them and because they're probably the areas that people have learned least about yeah certainly i think i think um, the pace of the green agenda and the change and electrification is um, what's here now uh, and sort of becoming more readily available uh, a personal view, being involved in the sector now, uh, both national and international level, um, working with um, Paul on the battery side of things, etc. Um, personal view and the view of many experts within the field, really, is that electrification is here and with us, um, probably can be dominant for the next you know, three to five years, mm-hmm. whilst all the alternative um, options are being developed and infrastructure is improving. So definitely lithium-ion batteries are you know, amazing at what they do in terms of storing energy and providing energy, but all the surrounding issues in terms of environmental, you know, sourcing uh, raw materials. Um, I was going to say, ins- yeah, if you talk about holistically zooming out, the sheer manufacturing of that process has a colossal environmental cost, and we're all quite um, unsure of the usability and um, recyclability of these 
uh, things beyond their life as intended as as EV, you know, vehicles and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, as you said, that holistic is it is it green? Um, so there's the the sourcing of materials, the the manufacture um, during use, their stability in terms of um, thermal runaway and fire, um, the environmental contamination if that does happen, but then also the disposal and uh, the environmental impact there. So personal view um, that I've formed, um, you know, through education really is that uh, that is the predominant um, fuel type at the moment, alternative. Mm-hmm. But um, fully recognising, uh, researching and delivering the courses that other alternatives will come through strongly and most likely take over. And yeah, you reckon? Be, yeah, definitely. I think hydrogen no. has definitely got some place to play. But again, someone's got to want to go with it. Do you know yeah, what I mean? So, They've got to go uh, up against the Elon Musks of the world and have enough absolutely. capital to yeah, make yeah. it. But um, uh, already, already you've got um, yeah, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, whereas a mixture of electric and hydrogen. But the likes of Toyota and JCB have already sort of declared their route of hydrogen combustion engines as, you know, step away from electrification. Um, why I didn't I realize, France... sorry, and just to make it really idiot proof for, for, for myself and perhaps people like me, um, hydrogen vehicles are actually electric vehicles. People, people, that I, that was a real trigger moment for me not so long ago. It's just the process through which the electric is produced. Right in saying that? Uh, so there, it's what what you call a fuel cell vehicle. So yes, it's got an electric battery, and you plug it in and charge that electric battery, and that will uh, power the vehicle for say three hundred miles. Mm-hmm. But on board, there's um, obviously hydrogen stored in tanks and a fuel cell, so that when the electric battery is nearing the end of its uh, capacity um, on a journey, the fuel cell will start burning the hydrogen to create more electricity to extend the range, basically. So yeah, mm-hmm. so when when people are generally talking about a hydrogen vehicle currently, it's a, a fuel cell vehicle. So it is a mixed electric um, stroke high, uh, hydrogen vehicle. Mm-hmm. Whereas um, Toyota and D- and uh, JCB are pursuing the hydrogen combustion engine. So a combustion engine uh, that will purely run from hydrogen gas. Um, so no wow. electric, electrification. So yes, and I know for, uh, for a fact I was out in France recently and I saw uh, some of the infrastructure being built in. Although they are putting electric charging infrastructure across the country, again as a country they are pursuing the hydrogen route and actually installing hydrolysis plants um, on the road network where they can both produce hydrogen from solar power and water supply. That hyd- I was hydrolysis- about to say because most people have the argument where they go, yeah, but hydrogen's barely present in the atmosphere it's something ridiculous like 0.005 percent or something like that but it's in vast quantities in like you say the water and hydrocarbons and things like that absolutely yeah so purely uh it can yeah with a a, a green energy source solar power um uh, water supply you the process of hydrolysis separates the hydrogen off uh, sep- uh the oxygen can be captured and used or dispersed mm. But then the key point is the hydrogen can be delivered via a pump at that location. So mm. you take away road tankers, fuel tankers, road infrastructure. Um, mm. it can be Which again gives us the ability to utilise many of our natural water sources that are Absolutely. across the UK. Yeah. Where the, from the time when everyone said hydro dams and stuff were no use, it's because we didn't have a, a different level of technology. So you could, you know, they, they still have their use anyway, but you could now overlay this technology on that and and, you know, heighten its use want to better absolutely situation. yeah um and yes there's still some safety issues around you know stored gases etc um you know the hydrogen tanks within a, a vehicle there's safety the... issues with everything though isn't there i yeah, always say absolutely. there's no solutions only trade-offs no, everything right, yeah, we're yeah. doing now is really dangerous we have you know we just have control elements for it 100 uh, percent. and yeah there are risks with um you know all of these alternative fuel types you know compressed natural gas on lorries etc but they've all got safety systems built in and again, it's the um, the the attention that when something does go wrong with an alternative fuel vehicle, obviously the media interest currently, yeah, every day we've got vehicle fires, we've got ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine, petrol, diesel. You know, the car fires happen, vehicle fires happen every day. Um, you know, the percentage of these alternative fuel vehicles on the road is currently small, just short of a million of EVs on the road in the UK. But with the the tidal wave that's come in to meet the green agenda, mm. yeah, responders and fire crews are, are going to come across these vehicles more and more often. Um, whether it's in an RTC where they've got to make make that vehicle as safe as possible, 
Um, certainly in our training we say you can't make safe one of these vehicles you can make it safer um, yeah. there's always that inherent risk um, from whether it's you know stored energy in an electric battery or whether it's pressurized gases um, mm. flammable explosive gases but yeah so personal view is yeah electrification is definitely dominant currently um, and yes battery technology will change battery chemistry and there may be some safer electric batteries coming through in terms of um, solid state batteries or even graphene batteries now um, wow. which uh, yeah, I've got none of the lithium ion complexities or risk of thermal runaway, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, electrification will continue, but I think definitely um, some more green alternatives, um, yeah, and certainly based around hydrogen in some factor, whether it's fuel cell mixed with electric or whether it's... I'd certainly that prefer of... that. Only through, and again, I'm going to show one very small wedge of information that I've managed to accumulate you know, the, the usability of my EV vehicles relies on me slow charging them at home, which is best for the battery. But, you know, I'm about to travel in one of my other career pathways at the moment when I travel to a fire and rescue service, it's about 200 miles away. I'm going to have to charge about twice and I'm going to have to do that in a very fast charge, which is very bad for the thing, basically. So the, the you know, the sustainable solution involves shortening the life of the thing do you know what i mean there's it's, it's one of those things where it's like this isn't ideal to be honest it's like the best way for me to use it is the worst thing for it does that make sense yeah absolutely uh, and again for our business we we've got uh, an, a full electric vehicle um both for company transport to, to tick the environmental box and uh, our business but also to we use that vehicle as a, a demonstrator vehicle on our ev courses so we mm. take it apart expose the high voltage components show the the responders where the isolation and then it never are, works the same again that's right yeah <laughs> i've always got a spare uh, cut loop uh, in case that goes missing but um but like you say it's um yeah it's fine around uh, geographical area we do the same we charge it at home uh at the office um you know overnight trickle charge the battery is happy with that if you're roadside you know lithium ion batteries don't like the extremes um ultra fast chargers now you know pumping electricity into that battery um it's going to shorten the life it's going to affect the, the the state of health of that battery but uh and interestingly um yeah the battery scientists um you know mentioned paul earlier and his colleagues um i mean they talk about uh, electric vehicle batteries as century batteries or million mile batteries you know they are robust they they very efficient at what they do yeah the degradation of the cells is very very minimal and they're doing lots of um yeah projection testing etc so the question is then um, when a vehicle manufacturer puts an eight year warranty on a battery, you just question what's that based on? Certainly not science and uh, <laughs> exactly. life of the battery. Yeah. <laughs> just, um, that was which, a which is, packet yeah, calculation all the way. Absolutely, which is part of that FUD, if you like, <laughs> that that fear and uncertainty and doubt. And it just um yeah, people perceive then it's not a viable financial option if they've got to replace the batteries after eight years where actually scientifically there's no you know basis of that. Um and this is where maybe, you know, the social media platforms things like that you've got other what i call smes mm -hmm. social media experts <laughs> uh, that uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe um give their opinions or thoughts but the trouble is that affects a uh, large listening audience that um they say know, wise men speak when they've got something good to say idiots yeah. speak just to say something Absolutely. so much of it is just screaming into the void in social media isn't it it's just 100%. Oh God! Yeah. We do the posting ghost. We have a platform yeah. that just puts things out for us because I personally struggle to live in that environment. It's not good. It wouldn't be good for my mental health. I don't think I could. Absolutely. I think it would teach me behaviors that would make me very poor at having conversations like this. 100%. Without yeah, going too much down a rabbit hole. Lost, but, the, um, lost the art of conversation. Yeah. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So I'd love to just um, close the loop on if we could, because again, I want to be respectful of your time. When it comes to investigating uh, incidents of vehicle collisions and stuff like that, could you map over the relationship between uh, highways agencies, police, and if there's any differences between the examples we've given around uh, commercial or domestic fires versus those that happen on the roadways? Yeah, absolutely. So what we're seeing now, especially with um, electric vehicles, is the yeah the impact on the uh, strategic road network um, if these are involved in either road traffic collision or or yeah. and or melting the runaway fire. <laughs> Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, well, just sheer duration. Yeah, we've seen yeah. recent examples: the the transporter lorry in the M1. It closed the M1. Yeah, both directions for twelve hours. Million um, pound the, an hour, isn't it, or something like that? Yeah, that's a yeah rumored uh, sort of impact on the community and commerce. Um, so yeah, definitely, it's a multi-agency approach to these incidents to try and reduce down 
the uh, impact of these. Um, and that comes down to the sort of, you know, uh, suppression options. Um, how can we um, remove that vehicle you know, from the strategic road network? Um, and I know um, there's various options available. You know, abroad, you'll see submersion units, you know, big uh, lorry backs you know, with mm. you know, gallons and gallons of water. Speaking to Paul and stuff, though, supposedly the manufacturer strongly discouraged that <laughs> because it doesn't. Absolutely. I know, yeah. obviously, total total um, transparency, Neil has his own solution with the EVCU. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, submersion, first of all, like you say, is um, water and electricity don't mix, uh, general premise. Um, so that vehicle EV that's been involved in a road traffic collision, um, you know, if we submerse it in water, um, that doesn't stop um, thermal runaway. Uh, and we've got, you know, ex- videos of, of batteries running into thermal runaway underwater and they just continue. They don't yeah. need oxygen. There's a good um, one with the Fire and Rescue Service. They've put it in a dam, haven't they? A dam, yeah. They yeah, I think that's the sure. I think and smoking yeah. and the fire is still under the water. And Absolutely. you're like, what yeah. are you going to do? That's gonna, just going to break that dam in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's the thing. We've got to recognize that the actions of responders could actually cause the situation to get worse. Um, yeah, and, uh, best of yeah, intentions. So, but, so know. yeah, for me, um, looking across, uh, you know, independently, if you like, at the various and on our courses, we show all the different equipment and methods of, you know, suppression, containment, blankets, under under chassis fogging, um, you know, everything that's available. Um and uh, for me, the predominant um, sort of method at the moment would be definitely a blanket has got its role to play in containing that that thermal runaway fire, protecting boundaries, but again, doesn't extinguish the fire. Um, mm. It would just uh, contain it. And then um, in terms of shortening the duration, maybe um, for heat absorption is under chassis cooling, but misting mm. um, to make maximum sort of temperature cooling. Jets of water, yeah, we see on social media um, almost celebration that you know ninety thousand gallons of water used to to extinguish the CV um, or submersion units. All we're doing is creating contaminated water. Yeah, another environmental impact. Um, so for me, yeah, containment units are great. I was um, we've actually just come back from Norway doing some live uh, electric vehicle burns with Hyundai and Kia. Um, and where do uh, I get my invitation to all this sort of stuff? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> next time maybe. Um, uh, as uh, we spoke previously, our normal course is we run in Ireland. Uh, um, and yeah, definitely. Ireland's beautiful as well. Yeah, open, open invite to to come out to there. But uh, this was quite a unique um, opportunity to to work with those two vehicle manufacturers to train uh, thirty of their engineers from eight different countries. Um, it was wow. about um, the vehicle examination post thermal runaway. Um, yeah, the effects of it. Um, but we saw there um, a prolific use of blankets uh, um, as a predominant um, sort of containment method. And uh, the same as in Holland, you know, a network of containment units around the road network ready to just uh, be deployed by recovery agents to wow. lift and move that vehicle safely. Um, to I was going to say, because the blankets are great, but the roadways and highways agencies are going to want to get that thing open again. Absolutely. They're yeah, like, 100%. Okay, that's great, lads. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, fantastic. And, yeah, Can you, you move know, it? You mentioned um, yeah, uh, Neil Peterson from uh, Fire Containers UK. They've now got their unit uh, available on the run through West Midlands Fire Service um, mm-hmm. and uh, beach recovery agents. Um, that's uh, to exactly provide that, to uplift that vehicle um, in as safe as way as possible. It's not a submersion unit, it, but it's got a misting system that's automatic. So should that vehicle go into thermal runaway during or reignite during transport? And I think maximum, it's something like 800 litre tank or something. Yeah, it's absolutely. 500 or, to 300 or something re- like yeah, that. And again, re- it just recircles, doesn't it? Recirculated, contained, so that minimal contaminated water can be dealt with afterwards through the, the waste process. Um, but the vehicle can then sit in that containment unit almost in quarantine. Um, yeah, I know Neil's had interest from uh, vehicle manufacturers. Yeah, maybe if a customer's car comes into a dealership, I tip um, my hat to him. It's a big punt. It's a big financial investment. We know there's a we know that there's desire for it, but um, you know, it's just the hope that people uh, recognize or at least seek to understand the technology and the justifications behind it. Um, yeah, for not absolutely. just Neil, but other people to find sustainable solutions to these. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and myself, as you know, Firewise UK, we've we've teamed up with our RTC to deliver EV responder courses. Um, you know, um, my expertise and and their skills to justice, uh, you know, accreditation, etc. That's so, a real team of Avengers, right there. I like yeah. that. <laughs> uh, and I think that was the thing. It was, um, yeah, we're all individually trying to educate responders, and that's what it's about, really. Yeah, um, yeah, is is spreading knowledge and awareness, of raising about risks and hazards to responders. 
and those courses now we're delivering, like say, across the sectors. Um, we've got fire and rescue services that are, are desperate for guidance, policies, standard operating procedures, um, equipment recommendations. We've got highways agency um, who have engaged with us now about their responders being first on scene coming across. Yeah. Um, ambulance service. We've um, we just authored their um, guidance procedures for any medical responders coming into contact with electric vehicles. So that'd be going on to their. How do you find time for all this, Martin? Uh, yeah, well, uh, having retired in January, I've been retired six months. I said to my wife recently that I was going to go back to the fire and rescue, and she looked at uh... me quizzically. And I said, "Well, occasionally we used to get rotor days, <laughs> but yeah. uh, <laughs> no." But I think that's the passion of it, um, Pete. Is um, yeah, gives both... you tremendous freedom as well, doesn't it? Though, because now you can do the bits you're really interested in. Hundred percent. Yeah, interested. and for me, you know, I had thirty years service. I joined at twenty one, left at fifty one. There was always that need for me to do something else. And if I can predominantly focus on training others and sharing knowledge and um, yeah, experience, then that's my passion, really. Um, so, yes, it's a. I'm trying yeah, to cheat I'm, the system. I'm trying to start early and just hope that I don't get sacked in the process and try and have all these adventures that's right, whilst yeah. I'm still in the service. <laughs> but, but again, when you've got, um, you yeah, know, and I call myself a subject matter enthusiast, I let other people determine expertise. Um, oh, that's um, good. I'm going to steal that. Yeah, right. I know. It's, a, it's my opening line, really. But um, yeah, because for me, working in courts, it's the court that decides your expertise based on qualification, experience, knowledge. Um, so, yeah, I'm an enthusiast. Uh, I deliver my courses um passionately um it's about sharing that knowledge um yes obviously i do it as a business but um yeah it's more about um educating responders really and, and their their safety um and ultimately you know the safety of the public uh, in dealing with those incidents that are going to become more and more common martin i found that absolutely fascinating we've been talking for two hours now it's that is just astonishing <laughs> <laughs> it probably echoes that yeah. subject matter enthusiast that you speak about there I love these conversations, mate. You've been so very generous and patient with uh, some of my stupid questions. Um, and I really appreciate it, mate. I, I get really excited because obviously people won't ever record this and then it will sit on the hard drive for a little bit and then the editing team will get around to doing it. Sure. I'm so excited about this form of communication and how many people can benefit from it. Because when you started 30 years ago, when I started 20 years ago, whatever it was, we read the debriefs. We had to read the manuals of firemanship and stuff like that. I don't think that's happening anymore with the greatest respect. I think there's, there's a few, there's a few, of course, who are yeah. still doing that. But yeah. we need to evolve as everything else Absolutely. evolves around us and finding new ways um, to, to share this information. And I think this is going to be such an incredible... We've had so many questions and requests around fire investigation. We had a bunch of requests around incident command the other day. And it brings a sense of guilt to me to seek out these SMEs such as yourself and um, hope that they are humble enough, hungry enough to uh, come on and uh, they have a good enough self-awareness to to do as great of an articulate job as you've done today and taking me into the depths of these different areas and really fleshing out some of the valuable detail that I know I wish I'd have heard when I came into the Fire and Rescue Service. And I'm just really grateful that you've been able to give us that today. Been a pleasure, Pete. Thanks for having me on. The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, talent, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders. And please head over to our Patreon page and for just £3 a month, you can support the future of the podcast. Please finally hit that follow, subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening. And wherever you're in the world, please support your emergency services responders. And thank you for listening.